Okay, now we get a little more concrete. That was before, that was at that 10,000 foot level. Um, <clears throat> first of all, how many of you are uh, trainers? A lot of you are, great. Session's over. Oh, good. Time to move on. Now, um, some of you that aren't trainers, you're here because you want to hear about adults and behavior and how to influence and whatever, probably. Um, I've, I've made this presentation a number of different times. I'm going to do it a little bit different this morning. I'm going to try to, try because it's a smaller group, try to uh, make it a little bit more interactive and have you, you work together a little bit. And one of the things that uh, uh, you know, I've, I've gotten feedback on on the presentation is that, that I spend a lot of time at the beginning with some stories and getting you involved before I get into the tips or the, you know, some of the things we're going we're gonna to hit on. So that's why I handed this out to you so that if you decide you want to leave halfway through, you at least have the paper that I provided with all the detail and you have this that you could take notes on if you wish. But near the end what I'm going to do is I'm going to give everybody a little card with all the tips on. And this is the one that most people hang on to because it's laminated and you don't throw it away and you can hang on to it. And it's got some pretty good information on it uh, that, I, that I try very hard to, to follow myself. But looking at, uh, at what we're going to cover today, whoops, what did I do? Hit the wrong one. You know, looking at the session objectives, and I'm going to try to use this as a clicker, uh, you know, we're going to try to talk about Try. We're going to talk about understanding adult learners so that we all understand that we are adults. We all learn in certain ways. We all have our own biases, personality wise, learning wise, etc. Uh, we have our own ways of communicating, things like that. And then talking about how to make training more real, more relevant. And I'm going to say current and relevant over and over again today because it's really important that whatever the training you provide that it not be a canned presentation that has no relevance to the workers that you're trying to influence. Um, one of the big problems that, that we all have in training related to safety is that we get, uh, we get hung up. Uh, it's natural. I know I've, it's happened to me in my career. Um, on training for OSHA compliance. There's a big difference between training for OSHA compliance and training for safety. And what we're going to talk about today is really the individual and how to communicate and how to get through to and as I'm presenting today, if any of you have other ideas or other thoughts you want to share, it's an open forum. Please feel free. Uh, we are recording this because I guess we're going to make it available afterwards for some who weren't in the session. So I'll try to repeat the question or repeat the comment. So don't, you know, what, what, what's he doing that for? It? That's why. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to get through these eight tips that basically are, are aimed at improving your odds for success. Um, so it's not a how to train session. Okay? If you're looking for how to establish a program, how to identify your objectives, how to go about putting together your overall approach to training, what your test questions should be, that's not what this session is going to do, though we will hit on some of it. Okay? First of all, we're all unique. You know, I, I said that early on. And what I'd, what I'd like you to do, humor me for a minute here, I'd like you all to, uh, on a piece of paper or on the back of, back of this, this thing here, I'd like you to write down five words or a five word phrase that describes you. Five words or a five word phrase that describes you. And yes, I'm going to ask for volunteers. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Oh, sure. Oh, you didn't get it? Oh, okay. Were there any more of those? Yeah, I had about. Uh, that's all we had. Maybe there, are there any spots back there? Okay. Okay, I apologize for that. Okay. Um, so, five words, all right? Well, five words. I, I don't know that I could explain or describe myself in five words, but um, this morning, excited, no doubt. I was excited to be here today. Uh, nervous. When I got done with my presentation, my hand was like ice. I went to shake a couple of hands, I was like, oh my God. <sighs> Did I look like that on stage? Probably not. Um, I practice the presentation, so I'm professional, I practice. Okay, what other words? Uh, <laughs> loving husband, no, uh, yeah, okay, on and on. Would somebody share their list, please? Yes, ma'am. Enthusiastic, energetic, happy, pleasant, 
you are a positive person. We like you. You smile. Okay? All right, that's good. Your brain is set up in a certain way. All right? Someone else? Please. Yes, ma'am. A little more internal, though family focused. That's great. All good things. All right, we've got two women. Now let's have some men. Come on, guys. Anybody? Yes, sir. Wow. You get things done. You're the guy I want on my team because I'm one of these delegating kind of people. I, I come up with the idea, I don't know how to do it. Okay, that's great. Um, anyone else? Anybody in back? I know, you're all looking away. Yes, sir. <laughs> you said either a, a set of words or a phrase. Yep. And mine is, what would you do when scared? What would you what? What would you do? Well, the whole phrase is, what would you do if you weren't scared? What would you do if you weren't scared? Okay. It's kind of opens, uh -huh. opens a little bit up. Yeah, we're, we're going to hit on that one pretty big. Uh, fear, fear really gets in the way of learning. Um, we have a lot of things that we bring to us, bring to the play. We're all adults. We all have experiences, and they've colored us in many, many different ways. Um, we'll never know everybody we're going to train and how their, how their world has been, uh, uh, you know, changed by all that. But, you know, no doubt about it, there, there are many things. You know, the other is, how many of you are engineers? Okay. Okay, not too many. How many of you are supervisor managers? Okay. <laughs> And in that role, are you in charge of safety, or, or is that part of your, okay. And then how many of you are in what I would call, you know, ASSC safety professional kind of people? Okay. So we've got a good mix. That's great. Um, again, as we talk about things and move things forward, the more we can talk about how we individually look at engaging and involving our learners and setting up our training so that we can be successful, that's really what this is all about. That's, that's our overall goal. So here you are. You have a training program you're going to put on on fall protection. And um, you've taken the time and you've really, really thought through what you want to cover. And uh, at the end of the day, I've been in this place. No matter how much money, time, and hard work, it's still a gamble in many ways. And this isn't a put down on anyone. It's really a challenge that we all face when we put on an education program of any kind. I don't know any of you. So part of what I was just doing now is trying to get a feel for who you are, what the audience is, kind of warm myself up, but also begin the process of warming you up. When you're training people, they're going to come in with a can of Coke. I mean, yeah. Go on, on, it depends upon what your company allow, but a can of Coke. Uh, their brain has been somewhere else. They're at this session, they might know what the title of it is, but they really don't know what it's all about. So in the beginning, I had a slide that talked about what we're going to talk about here in general terms and what we weren't going to be talking about here. So you could make a decision in the early stage here of whether you wanted to go to a different session. I wouldn't have been offended if you had gotten up and gone to another session. I'm glad that you didn't. But Okay, so it's part of what we're doing is trying to improve our odds. And so what we're going to go through today are those eight tips, as I mentioned. So why do we train? Um, I'd like you to think about, this is one of those trainers that likes to make you do work, yes. I'd like you to think about one of your early training experiences, because many, most of you raised your hand and said you're involved in training, where you really understood the importance of what you were doing. I'd like you to think about one. Anybody willing to share? Yes, sir. Paramedics. Paramedics. Very important. Life and death. Yeah? Who were you training? What kind of individuals were in your program? No, as a student. Oh, as a student, okay. Okay. All right. But as a trainer, okay. Do you have anything? No? 
Okay. Yes, sir. Has the communication had a refinement? Yeah, absolutely. What brought it to light? What made it important to you? What what There's revelation did you have? Out there and the folks that come in and the school understanding of what they're when they walk in that front gate, what are they really walking into? Mm -hmm. Raising the awareness in their eyes. Mm -hmm. Do you have people coming in that are that are somewhat trained already, that are aware, or do you have to start from the ground zero? The whole the whole gamut had new employees and uh, had, and, and and I was actually somewhat new, and I was given the refresher for folks that have been recruiting lately. Mm. So, so how, do you, how do you knock the dust off without putting them to sleep or something they've heard 30 times already? Yeah, exactly. I, my, my background, I was a safety director for Clark Oil many years ago, and we had three refineries. And I can, I can empathize, you know, you had all the, the operators that go through very high-level detailed training on operations. But when it comes to safety, they really haven't had an awful lot. So, yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And uh, one particular time had two physicians, husband and wife, were physicians. And to try to teach doctors how to put the car seat in correctly, because, you know, doctors have gone to school for years and years and years and years. Mm -hmm. And then they actually had it in wrong. And to, you know, really think, how am I going to do this correctly to not offend them, but then to get them to do it safely, and then to maybe pass the word on to, you know, their patients and their family members. and. I got it done, but it was a bit of a challenge because of, I guess, them being physicians, it's intimidating. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, we go to them for advice for the most part, probably everybody in this room. Sure. You know, it's, uh, to dovetail on that one, when uh, I was with a, a biomedical company at the time that, that Hazard Communication came out, <clears throat> and in putting a program together for our, our technicians, our engineers, but also our assembly people, we put it together a survey to really determine what did people know about hazardous materials, classifications, controls, et cetera. What we found was that the engineers scored the lowest on this kind of pretest we gave. And it, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't to say they didn't know anything, but the people actually working with the materials on a day in, day out basis were much more aware of what they needed to do. And, you know, I guess that there's logic there, but um, anyone else? I don't know, these guys said, I told them I was gonna call on them, but they're not raising their hand. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Very important, very important. Uh, you know, those life and death things, you know, the chemicals we work with, the pressures, the heats, the heights, um, you know, the environments. You know, I, I uh, have to tell you, being from the, a little bit of the oil industry and hearing that, uh, that Chevron, uh, with the rains this last week, shut down their rigs because of the mud, the slip and fall hazards, to me, that's a significant move. That means that we've come a long ways, at least that company's come a long ways, so that's a, that's a big deal. Um, my story is a, is a little bit different. I just want to share it for a second because it was sort of like, wow, I, I can't believe this. Um, I worked for a company, I know I've already told you I worked for two companies, this is the third one. <clears throat> Bucyrus Erie is a heavy mining machinery manufacturer and they make the very big machines that are used in strip mining. So this one happens to be a drag line and the drag line is so big you can drive three Greyhound buses into it side by side, the bucket excuse me, the bucket is so big. So that gives you an idea that the mast itself is longer than a football field. And uh, uh, the machine itself has walking shoes where uh, there, there are cams that rotate and these, these shoes actually come up and move forward and then lift the body, this entire housing of several hundred tons forward. And it's like uh, paving a, a six lane highway when you get done because of how it compacts everything. But I was a young safety professional working for this company out in Pocatello, Idaho. And we had brought in about 1,500, 1,600 uh, workers from all over the country, a lot from California, uh, plumbers, or not plumbers, pipe fitters, uh, welders, uh, machinists, uh, the like. And so I had this, this big group of people coming together. Um, <clears throat> it, was, it was really uh, amazing. And uh, I worked with a, uh, a management team that was very dictatorial their style, okay? And so when something went wrong, their immediate reaction was to blame the person or to really try to, uh, to shift the focus from the company or the situation to the person. And I think we all know from, from uh, you know, where we are with behavior-based safety, we've evolved to understand that 
if all we're doing is focusing on at-risk behaviors and the employee is the one choosing that behavior, therefore they're the problem, we have a problem. Human error is in context, and we found over and over again it has to do with the organizational setup of work and the supervisory communications and those kind of things. Okay, my story. One, one evening I got a telephone call, and it was from uh, Building 26. We had about 2.2 million square feet of manufacturing under roof. And we had been moving a truss section. A truss section was about as tall as this room. It was a truss. It had a V section to it, and it had another si side V. And uh, they had lifted it up, and they were in the process of doing some tack welds. And they didn't secure it properly. And the rigger gave the crane operator the signal to go because the crane operator had another pick to do down the bay. And the rigger didn't clear the chain. And what happened was the chain came back away and caught on the V of the truss, lifted up and dropped it on a welder who I'll never forget her name, Risha Caffey. Risha lived, fractured her pelvis, fractured both femur, uh, was in the hospital uh, months, and uh, never came back to work. Um, management wanted to fire her. They wanted to fire the crane operator. They wanted to fire the rigger. Okay. No talk about the supervisor. No talk about the general superintendent. Okay. We stepped back. We said, okay, let's take a look at our riggers training. Let's take a look at our, our crane operator training. And then let's look at how we train the welders and the fitters that are working around these operations and exposed to those hazards. And what we found was is that we'd done a very cursory training session for those people. We didn't really bring it to life the importance of clearing a stupid chain. Okay? We talked about miking the chain, we talked about the right size, we talked about lift points, all of that good stuff, but we didn't talk about the actual activities themselves that were going on during that workday. So my lesson that I got from that is when we're dealing with critical operations, no matter what they are, you can't do it in a classroom. You've got to go out in the field, you've got to ask questions, you've got to demonstrate, and really bring things to life. Okay? So having said that, does anybody have another story? Anything you want to share? There was another hand up back there. I don't know if you want to. Yes, sir. I'm in the field all the time. I'm doing training on stuff that the guys have already done. I do fire extinguisher training. Everyone that comes to work, you know, they're orientated how to do it. But I still, I go back with my water fire extinguisher and I swim by the pool can and actually use it. That's great. You know, unless you, if you've ever been in a fire, you know, and you, I mean, if you're a refinery, you know, it, you've been in it, you've seen fires, okay. Big deal. You got to know what you're doing. But a fire extinguisher in an office setting, I, I can't tell you how many times you walk into a place where they've never, ever shown how to pull a pin on a fire extinguisher or teach anything about the pass system. Ask where one is. Where, yeah, that too. Where the exits are. Have you ever had a drill? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we use that for the new employees that I've actually taught that training. That's great. Training in industry and, and, uh, using that for the new employees to teach them how to do a critical path. Mm -hmm. Things that they can refer to. You know, speaking of new employees, everybody's got a new employee orientation program? Yes. Okay. How long is it? <laughs> Three days. Three days. Okay. Three days. Don't be afraid. Who else? Yes? Two days. Two days. Again, um, work with firefighters and then we swap out there. Anybody less? <laughs> How long? About half a day. About half a day. Okay. Before our challenge is, is trying to you know, train uh, for the job. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That's it. It's very, very important. You know, what my, a lot of the clients that I work with now are in the uh, uh, transportation delivery industry, uh, Pepsi, Frito-Lay, Kraft, Amerigas, propane companies, and, and, and the like. And um, they hire people for really two skills. Either have they been in sales before because they see 
selling and communicating with the client and the customer when they deliver as really being an important thing to drive sales and, and get placement on shelves and things like that, or because they're, they're a, a CDL driver, okay? Really, as, and, and when they bring them in, they don't do much in the way of safety training. But uh, Pepsi, as an example, is anybody with a bottling company or a beverage company? Well, <clears throat> during the course of a day, they'll lift somewhere around three tons of product. And, uh, you know, the dollies will go upstairs and downstairs and up and down ramps. And they'll be bending and twisting and lifting and pushing and lifting overhead and all of this. And before we started working with them, they weren't doing really any uh, exercise and fitness, wellness discussion. They weren't doing any um, understanding of ergonomics and, and you know, physical body uh, control and the like. And uh, uh, since they began implementing this over the years, their losses have gone down, but still the work, that, that environment is very hostile. And that's why it's so important between every stop that the person do something to warm up or to stretch a little bit. Um, all good stuff. But it amazes me that they, their, their normal indoctrination program is about like yours, maybe four hours. And a lot of it is not safety. <laughs> it's operations. And uh, now get in the truck with Bill or with Sue and learn, learn the routes from them and learn what you're supposed to do from them. And, and by the way, you're going to be live in three days. Live from New York. It's Saturday Night Live. Yes, not too good. So moving along, we train for OSHA, no doubt about it. We train for job-specific hazards. Again, that's, that's really the, the key right there is trying to blend OSHA, you know, fall protection. Specific things you need to cover, but when it comes right down to it, where are my anchor points? Okay? How do I inspect my lan lanyard? How do I know that all of my other uh, equipment is proper? How do I know? Who maintains it in the meantime? Do you have a system for it? Great one here is lockout tagout. Well, Everybody knows what OSHA requires for lockout tagout, no big deal. But getting people as an organization, when we're dealing with lockout tagout, we're dealing with an organism here, folks, not just one person, maybe not just two. You could be dealing with an entire department. You've got what? Affected and authorized. The authorized are the ones putting the locks on and doing the tagging and maybe doing the work. The affected are all the other people in the area. They all need to know what the risk is and when they see that lock and they see that tag, they understand what it means. But also management and supervisor need to understand that are there any other sources of energy that we also need to look at besides this, this one, let's say. Okay? Are there alternate sources? Uh, air, pneumatic, et cetera, we need to bleed lines. Do we have built up, you know, do we need to uh, dismantle a, a, a pipeline, or not a pipeline, but a piping system so there's nothing that will flow through. Um, hot work, same kind of thing. Understanding everything you need to check, permitting, Understanding why permitting for hot work or confined space or even companies do it for lockout is so important. So we don't miss anything and you've got someone else who's not doing the work checking to make sure that the job is going to be done correctly. Okay. Is anybody familiar with the ANSI standard on safety and health training? Well, I, I bring it up because this is where the how-to of my session comes in. I'm going to refer you to the ANSI standard. And the reason is, is for, I don't know how much it is, 20 bucks or 25 bucks, it goes through the detail of how to think about setting up a training program. And um, just uh, the, the, you know, the sections of it include, you know, after you get past scope and definitions, uh, training program administration, uh, resource management, program evaluation, training development. It starts with needs assessment. Um, I've experienced this, and I'll bet maybe you have, have as well. Um, an incident occurs. Maybe it's a near miss, but it had the potential for some really catastrophic outcome. And the decision is made to retrain everyone. Well, they look at you like, well, it didn't happen because I didn't know. It happened to be cause. And where I'm going with that is, is the obvious, that, that we often think that something happened or nearly happened because people didn't know. So in doing a needs assessment, whether it's a full course or whether it's actually implementing any kind of a training session, whether it's even toolbox talks, are we providing information that's based on need? Again, 
current and relevant information to that person. Because if it isn't current and relevant, their brain's going to be thinking about what they're going to do after work. Or what they're, you know, what the, what's really important is what I do when I get back to my work area. Okay? Because that's what the boss cares about. All right? So thinking about that and moving ourselves forward, um, you know, a needs analysis also gets you to a point of, of identifying the importance of the training, which can tie to the resources that you're going to be able, you're going to ask for. You know, now my company is a, a training company, and we, we have lots of off-the-shelf, you know, whether it's Hascom or Laka, whatever, that doesn't matter. And I'm not here to, to sell you anything. But if somebody said, if I buy that program, is my company going to be in compliance? My salespeople hate this because I say, now is the time where you tell that customer, you know what, I don't think that you're the kind of company that we want to sell our product to. And my salespeople back up and they say, what? I'm not going to do that. This isn't about compliance. This is about health and safety of your workers and the importance of making sure they understand what they're supposed to do. So a lot of what I do is work with customers to sit down with their management and talk about the problems that they're having and try to identify where training or communication fits. And is it the first thing you do or not? And like in the case of, uh, and we've been talking lockout or confined space entry, um, lockout in particular, if training is the first thing you do and you haven't established your lockout points, you haven't put together your schematics, you haven't identified uh, how you're going to manage your keys and your locks, a color code system, what are you going to do at shift change? All of that has to be determined before you do any training, but a lot of companies aren't at that place. Now, many of you are with larger companies. They would be, probably. Smaller companies, maybe not, because there's, there's a way to think, a patterned way, and there's a sequence, and we're going to talk a little bit about that when we're talking with some of our tips. The other thing that, that's really good about this is it talks about selection of how you're going to you know, what your media is, if you're going to use PowerPoint or if you're going to use uh, handout materials, uh, if you're going to do any team, team skill training, what that might look like. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of other things that, that really uh, bring the training to life more than anything. Um, is anybody familiar with, uh, you know, ASSE has a new ANSI standard or worked on a new ANSI standard called Prevention Through Design? Anybody familiar with that? Well, it's, it's in a way, it's safety 101. It's, it's how to do hazard analysis on a risk basis. And, uh, you know, one of, one of the slides that I had earlier was that we, we're going to be looking more at the risk of an operation versus the compliance aspects of an operation. And if we can do a better job uh, as safety people learning about how to calculate risk or how to think from a risk standpoint, what's the implication of what we're doing and what's the potential that could occur, and what's the likelihood of certain things happening, and designing your training, your control systems, and everything around limiting first, worst case, most likely first, and then working yourself down to minimal control, minimal problem, infrequent occurrence. You know, there's a whole grid and hierarchy you follow through. But um, I, I would recommend that, that you take a look at, at both this, this ANSI standard here and then this one on prevention through design, because we're, we're going to hear more about it. Um, you know, the training itself for me begins with you identifying for yourself what the objectives are. Um, has anybody been to ASSC's leadership conference? Are there any chapter officers here? Well, what the leadership conference does is it backs up and it says, okay, for each of like, like at this chapter, you have a president, president-elect, secretary, treasurer, you know, PDC chair or whatever, what do those people need to know to be able to do those jobs and do them well, okay? So you step back and you identify what are the learning objectives, what are the key pieces of information that we need to, to present, but then more importantly, how can we help them better learn how to do this? So what skills do they need to know? So you have a knowledge base and you have a skills base, okay? Today's session is more about knowledge and about some modeling of some of the skills. Hopefully I do well. Hopefully you give me a, a good score here today, but maybe not. Um, but the learning objectives are really important because as we move into this, the number one tip is that you know the topic and how it relates to your people. This might sound really crazy, but um, a lot of people 
train on safety topics they don't know very well. They do a little uh, refresher, they read the booklet, they read the instructor guide, and then they go out and do the training. It's a big mistake. And uh, a, 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 real tr a good trainer, uh, that's not, I don't, I, I don't want you to make you feel like you're a bad trainer if you don't do this, but and a more exper experienced trainer would know that if I don't know this, t this topic, then I need to look at my group and identify those people that know that topic and have them come in and help me with it. I'm going to learn from them as a trainer, okay? I'm going to help that person come to life knowing and feeling that they were important, but also we're going to be able to make a subject and a, and a, and a training session that, that's more important and more valuable to everyone involved. Okay. okay. Um, here's a top secret one, right? Kids and adults learn differently. Um, you know, thinking about every one of us in the room, um, we all come from different places. You know, um, people that went to college, where, where did you go to school? Fresno State. I'm sorry? Fresno State. Okay, Fresno State. My team, Wisconsin, plays them a few times in football. You got a good team, yes. Indiana. Indiana. Anyone else? Okay. Yes, sir. You say, oh, really? Okay. Good. Good. IUP. IUP. So we got some safety grads here. Good deal. Yes. Hmm? Okay. It doesn't matter whether it's a university or a college or a trade school or what. Okay. We all have different orientations. Okay, I'm a badger. She's a bulldog. bulldog. Okay, uh, I know my, I've got my, my boys uh, um, surprised me one day. They said they said, uh, "Hey, Dad, pick a college team, any college team." Okay, I said, uh, "I don't know, Toledo, Zips, Fresno State, Bulldogs." I couldn't believe it. I couldn't pick a name of a college team that they didn't know the nickname of. So uh, that's another tip that was relevant to them. You know, they decided they were going to learn it on their own. Um, boy, I could get into a whole big long thing now on uh, extrinsics versus intrinsic motivation. And we could talk about behavior-based safety being ex extrinsic and not intrinsic. And what do we need to do to shift that? We're going to talk about some things that you can do to help with that. Because when we put together training, we want to be credible. The last thing that I would want to ever do is stand up in front of a class or in front of anybody talking on a topic and have them behind the, behind their, the scenes saying, oh boy, this guy Pollock, he doesn't know blank from Shinola. Well, these are three words that are very important. Current, relevant, and accurate. The accurate, a lot of times, isn't known by the person you're doing the training or education, educating on, but it sure is known when something goes wrong if you provided ins insufficient or ina inadequate information. Okay? Making sure that it's current and relevant are really the keys to all of this, and working with your people getting to that point. We all, we all filter based on our experience. We talked just a little bit about that, and as we're filtering, we begin to look at things differently. And uh, you know, some of the people, anybody here from Chevron? Okay. You know, you've got a system there where you're going through with employees and helping them understand, I mean, not just employees, but everybody, understand what their personalities, traits are, kind of Myers-Briggs-ish, okay? And then they put uh, a dominant color and a, and a secondary color. And so whether it's on a hard hat or on a name tag, you walk up to somebody, you know, I'd, I'd walk up to you and I'd see on your tag, I'd see a blue, I don't know what the colors are for, so don't, you know, a blue and a red, and I'd know immediately how you communicate and how you, what your orientation to, to work is, okay? That's pretty cool because from an education standpoint, that has a huge impl implication. So one thing you might want to consider doing is some type of education informing of your supervisor's managers to the fact that we have people who have different orientations and different filtering systems, okay? but then take it down to the employee level and begin to open those conversations up a little bit so we understand that we learn differently. You know, looking at our experience, we also have bias. Everything we've experienced, we've put a color on it, no matter who we are, where we come from. 
It's who we are. Uh, boy, right now, I mean, not right now, for the last many years, we've been in this world where you're a conservative, you're a liberal. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm a human being, okay? Um, de depending upon what you believe in, you know, wh where you've come from, who your parents were, you know, what radio show you listen to, whatever, it, it colors how you think and how you believe, okay? Well, that bias transfers over into what you perceive to be real. And once something is perceived to be, it's a perception, it's your reality. So in a learning world, experience creates bias. Bias creates perception. Now, in a training world, if we're creating content and experience that's positive, that's forward-looking, that's empowering, um, gets people to understand that the company wants to learn from mistakes. Everybody's going to make them. We're all human. You know, I've heard studies that, that when you're driving in a car for 15 minutes, you make somewhere between 12 and 15 human errors. I don't know how they do that. I've kind of checked my own, but, you know, I, I don't know. It's how we maneuver the car and where we're looking and how we're thinking and whatever. All right. Irrelevant. That was... Not relevant information, okay. Uh, experience, though. Creating this environment where safety is an expectation. What does safety mean? It doesn't mean that you don't do your job. It doesn't mean that um, you, you uh, 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 bring a level of risk or fear to the work you do. What it means is you work to understand how I can do this job safely efficiently and effectively. Studies of human error relating to experience and bias and perception tell you that when you do a post-incident investigation or a post-incident of a, of a near miss, whatever it is, and you're talking with the, the person involved about this, A, they never expected anything wrong would occur from what they were doing. Okay? Now, maybe to the extreme when they willfully violated. When they knowingly, willfully violated, that's different. But in normal operations, they didn't think about it. What they were thinking about was not, well, I'm a lazy son of a gun, I want to get this done as fast as I can, and I want to get the heck out of here. No. They wanted to get the job done in an efficient manner. <clears throat> they wanted their boss to be happy. They wanted to be able to make sure that they got on to the next task they had assigned. None of that relates to, oh, that idiot. He willfully chose to violate our safety rule. No. What happens is from this experience thing, you have something that's called the normalization of deviation. Okay. What that means is you have a standard that you train people to, but over time, what they do deviates. Okay? Sometimes it's higher than the standard. Most of the times it's a little bit below the standard. And what happens over time is for that employee and probably others work with, that work with, uh, with her will begin to create the new normalization of that deviated behavior or that devi de deviated standard. It's really why, important why when you're watching people work that you come back early on in their career, early on in their job learning process, that new employee orientation thing, and look at what they're doing and how they're doing it and have a training program that gets them back as close to that standard as you can. Because, again, what happens more times than not when a really bad thing occurs, you go back in and you investigate it and you see that that employee or that work group has been doing that in that manner for a long time and supervisor never did anything about it or management never did anything about it. Okay? So, from a learning standpoint, once it became, becomes a perception that this is the way things are supposed to be done, you have a tough time turning the wave, or turning the, uh, the bus. Okay, so there's also a difference between what people want and what they need, okay? Does that make sense? Okay, well, that would be something you want, most likely, although maybe at the end of the day today you might need it. Okay, that would be a want. That's what, that's what you need, yeah, yeah, really. That's what you need, though, the, you know, the love of your family, 
things like that, and focusing your training in on what your employees need that are functional. You know, the Maslow hierarchy of needs. This is really where we're at. Um, you know, some people like opera. Some people don't. Some people like baseball. Some people don't. It's basically learning what people like and what they want and what they need and, and, and trying as best you can to communicate to everybody. You know, I'm, I'm looking around the room and, and I, nobody's fallen asleep yet, though a couple are beginning to. That's, <clears throat> that's a tough gig when you're in the morning <clears throat> and you're actually, it's a little bit of my voice doing that session and then doing this one, I'm a little dry. Is there any, could I get a glass of water? Would you mind? Yeah, anybody, if there is one. That's right. That doing it this way is okay. Because I've done it. And like you said, they, they don't think it's going to happen, even though mm -hmm. they know someone or they've heard Thank you very much. I appreciate they it. Have, they personally have done it 150 times, 200 times, 15 years. Nothing's happened. So their experiences have created their bias, and their reality is not going to happen to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I, I'm, just, I'm not trying to be, you know, I'll say it's one minute, but how, how do we get a tip for that? <sighs> if I don't cover it before the end here, come back and we'll talk about it, okay? I'm not trying to put him off, I just want to make sure, because that's a, that's a deep, deep subject. Um, <clears throat> how many of you have run a red light? Okay. Anybody do it on purpose? Oh, okay, in a hurry, whatever, okay. Nobody around, Way we go, okay? How many of you run a yellow light? Just about everybody, okay? What's the difference between a yellow light and a red light? About 30 seconds. Speed, okay, speed, yep, speed, okay? And timing, your speed and the timing of the light. Um, anybody have a car go through an intersection where you had the green light and they went in, through, in front of you? Scare the bejesus out of me. I gotta tell you, it's happened to me a few times. Um, it happens, okay? That person didn't want to run that red light, except a couple, couple people did, okay? <laughs> um, they were more in a, in a place of, of, of need. They needed to be somewhere, their brain was somewhere, focusing on what they needed to do, what the job was, and they, removed, they were removed psychologically from the moment. I'm only guessing, but you know, that's, that's the, what I've read and what I've learned, that the more you can get people when they're doing their work to be in the moment, whether you call it Kaizen or whatever you want to call it, the better off you're going to be. Okay. So moving forward, all right. Aligning work with other training. We all have a lot of other training that goes on at our companies and making sure that we've got our training aligned with the other training the person's going to receive. The more that we can integrate safety training with skills or job training, the better. Okay? The other thing to think about is the sequence of training that, that occurs. You know, like in the case of uh, our respiratory protection training, you probably need to have HASCOM training first to understand what the chemicals are and what the potential is, and then from there, respirator training, learning about the respirator, and then how to fit it, how to inspect it, et cetera, okay? Fitting all your training together and making sure that people also understand, based on the hazards of the work that you're doing, how things fit together, and how the HASCOM training ties together with the respiratory training, with the PPE training, with the fall protection, oh, with actually how I do my job, with the sequence I was trained to, taught to do my job, and things like that. How it all ties together, you get into a better place with the, with the person and the learning that occurs. Um, in my work with Amerigas, I learned that uh, they really focus on headlines, like most corporate executives do. You don't want to hear about propane cylinders flying across the 405 in LA. You don't want to hear about that. But the more I looked at what the issues were with this company, the real problem was this truck. It's called a bobtail. And, um, this company, when I was working with them in the beginning, <clears throat> had between, for five years running, 
they had between 35 and 50 bobtail rollovers. Hmm. Every time one of those rolled over, it cost at least $250,000 for the truck, not to mention any other property damage. And fortunately, only one person was killed in this five-year period of time, I, I, by the grace of God. This was a far bigger problem that they hadn't really addressed. So from a training needs assessment and what you focus on, it's understanding what's real in your organization, what's happening, and what has the greatest potential. Their response when they flipped a truck was to fire the driver. Really? Well, has anybody ever been on a propane bobtail truck? Anybody ever been on a milk truck or any truck that's got liquid in it? And what happens? Okay. <clears throat> well, these guys were not only flipping trucks, they were going up to stoplights and stop signs a little bit faster than they should, and they were stopping fairly quickly. So the liquid would go this way, and they'd hit the brakes hard, and then the liquid would go this way, and then hit it again, all right? Meaning that the truck would actually jump another two or three feet because the person early on in their career wouldn't know the dynamics of the truck. In putting together some of the training for this company, I asked one of the field supervisors, how long does it take before you really feel a new driver understands the dynamics of the truck? Well, there was a, another uh, kind of like a, a uh, tr uh, he was a route person, but he was a senior route person that did a lot of the training. It was weird. They looked at each other and they both opened their mouths at the same time, two years. What? You have people driving that vehicle for two years before you feel comfortable that they understand the dynamics? And it was from there that we developed more hands-on training, actually a week of training with that vehicle before you were the one who was actually out there driving it on your own. The guy said to me, the, 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 the training senior guy said to me, he says, yeah, you know, you don't really understand the dynamics until you're going around a, a clover leaf a little bit fast and a couple of your wheels come off. <laughs> okay, but, okay, to my point, are we training on the right things? Are we really getting things across to people the right way? Well, I'm looking at that thing, too. Is it, is it the design of the truck, too? Oops. I mean, is that part of the problem, too? You know? I mean, that's something you have to, when you have that many incidents. Yes. Is it the driver? It is. Is it the machinery that they're using? Yes. And another, like, like with Pepsi, training them in ergonomics when the truck, the way it's designed and how they get the product out of it, is an ergonomic nightmare. You know, what are you going to do? It's hard. So you're right. That's where prevention through design comes in. It's understanding not the people, but the environment in which they're working, the equipment, the tools, the processes that we put in place for them. Okay? So about five, five minutes? Okay. I'm going to move through this now. My Pepsi experience, I explained to you. Uh, what, what I didn't tell you is that one time I was doing a delivery with this guy to learn what the job was, and they had me uh, going into an office building, and he said, well, just take it through the door, no big deal. Well, it was on a hill, and I didn't position it right going through the door, and I lost a bunch of, a couple of 12 packs, and so the pop went rolling down the street. And I should have learned how to do that, not before I was out doing it in the field, which is how they learned to do it, okay? So that's how you learn, by making mistakes. All right, the curse of knowledge. Um, what this really means is, as we put training together, we know the subject, remember? We know the subject, okay? The people we're talking to and training probably don't know it the way we do. So sometimes we move too quickly with it. We start too far into the learning process. Another reason why it's important when you're doing specifically safety training is assess your audience and know where they are in their overall. Okay, I'm gonna do something really quick. I would like people to pair up, okay? However you do it, maybe, maybe it'll be just you and me, okay? Right, okay, I'd like you to pair up. And I don't care how you do it, just a couple next to you. And, and if you're not paired up, then just team with someone else and watch this. I would like you to, without saying a word or mouthing anything, I'd like to tap, have you tap the person next to you on the shoulder to a song that you know, okay? <laughs> Any song. Okay, go ahead. Do it. 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 Was just scary. What were you just doing? Okay. Can you see the Star Spangled Banner? Okay. 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 
Okay, without going around the room and asking for this, this is a great one for us to understand. You have the knowledge and you're trying to impart it, but the person doesn't have a clue what you're doing. They can't read your mind, okay? Okay, all right. Keeping training simple. Seeking participation is really important. I tried to do that today. I had some things that were built into the program to try to get you involved. It's important, knowledge is out there. Building teamwork is by getting the group to talk together and getting the people to know and think and, and, and solve problems together and, and look after each other because we're a family. Keeping it current, accurate, and relevant. Building rapport. In my paper I talk about this one. Rapport is really important. People need to feel need to feel that you care and you care about each other, all right? You know, coaching builds rapport. Walking up to somebody and not criticizing, but asking them a question or two, getting them to better understand what this is really all about. Offering affirmation. Um, a lot of times going through school, you don't get affirmation for learning. You find out on a test what your score was, and that's your only affirmation whether you got anything out of it or not. It's important. Sometimes that's in the workforce. You don't, you don't get those attaboys. That's right. Most when there's the a problem. That's the point here. The attaboy, the affirmation, the good job. And it doesn't always happen at the point of training. It happens later on. And saying, you know, Albert, great job, man. I really appreciate that. And that's why I, I, I didn't really call on you guys at all. It just, you know, wasn't one of those sessions. But, and here you go. You got a happy worker. I don't know. That was Sven from Minnesota, I think. I'm not sure. Number seven is setting goals. Helping your people set goals. You already got your training goals. You already know what your training about is about. But at the end of the session, hopefully you will do some of the things that I talked about this morning in my keynote, is identify for yourself in each one of these sessions, what's my takeaway? What can I implement? How can I change my thinking? What can I do differently? Okay? I would hope that your training, training folks would set some goals, keeping it current, accurate, and relevant. And number eight, at the end, like you're doing right now, you're about to fill out a, an evaluation form. Believe it or not, I, I take these really seriously. In fact, I, I brought my own if they didn't have one here because I really learned from you. Um, I know that this was a fairly short session, so I know that I also went through some things fairly quickly and didn't have some of the time that I wanted for some, some interaction. It's the way it was. You know, it's the way that the, that the day is scheduled. We've got a lot going on, which is terrific. You're getting your money's worth. But I want to take that information, I'll go back and I'll adjust my session next time I put it on and try to do something a little bit better or a little bit differently to, uh, to make that happen. And remembering all of these things that can get in the way of your training, not worrying about them, but being aware of them. And these are discussed in that paper that I've got for you as well. So at the end, this is what we want to have. Happy, smiling, productive, safe employees. So I probably didn't leave any time at the end here, but if there are any questions, I'll be around uh, for the day. If you'd like to you know, buttonhole me and have a cup of coffee or whatever, I'd love to talk to you. So thank you very much.